Thank you very much. It's an honor to be here for hour number two. If you weren't here for, for the Sunday school hour, I'll just uh, give a brief introduction of myself. My name's Nathan White. I'm married to Kayla White. Her maiden name was Rhodes. You may have known her. She attended SBU here for like seven years to get her physical therapy degree. Um, so we're married. We have three kids, Nora, Hudson, and Sarah. And they are ages four, three, and uh, like 10 months. So we're busy. Um, Kayla and I met at SBU, and I, she studied physical therapy. I studied church music. And while leading music at a church in Springfield, a missionary pilot came to our church to raise financial support. And through his speaking and testimony, God called me to missionary aviation. And that was in 2010. One week later, SOAR opened its doors here in Bolivar to train missionary pilots and mechanics. And I began my training in 2012. And I had no idea it would take 10 years to finally be at this point where we're getting ready to move onto the field. But that's what it took, and that's the average for a missionary pilot to get fully trained, funded into the missionary field. Um, we're, we, my family and I just spent a year in language school down in South Texas, and we are getting ready to move next month to Topeak, Nayarit, Mexico, to be a missionary pilot family. We serve UIM Aviation. We serve pastors, missionaries, short-term teams, doctors, medical teams, flying in supplies, personnel, medical evacuations, chickens, whatever they need, and we can shove in the airplane, we fly it out to them in the mountains. And uh, I'm here today at the invitation of the pastor to, uh, to share about our ministry, because y'all will be financially supporting our ministry going forward. We are very thankful for that. And so our ministry is now your ministry as well. Um, so thank you. May God bless you and your ministry here in Bolivar and around the world as you'll partner with us and other missionaries from all over the world. I know you are partnered with a, a lot of missionaries. What's the number? About, you know? Around 30 missionaries. So y'all have a global ministry. So thank you for that. May God bless you. I'm going to open with a, with a brief prayer and we'll get, get going. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this morning and the incredible privilege we have to gather here as family to worship you, to study your word, and to encourage one another with our songs and spiritual songs and hymns as we have just done. We ask that you will bless this upcoming hour. May you speak to us through your word. Uh, use me to speak here and uh, anoint this time, Lord. We ask that you'll help us to apply your word to our lives and live it out in the week going forward. And we ask this in the name of Christ. Amen. Okay, so 2022 has begun. If you didn't know, that's the year we're in already. 2022. Have you made your resolutions this year? How many of you are like anti-resolution? Like resolutions are bad things. We're gonna... All right. I'm here to preach to that group today. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I, I personally think it's good to have resolutions. <laughs> but, or goals, something like that. But what, if, if you're the resolution or goal-making type, what determines the resolutions you make, the goals you make? Is there an overarching, like a meta goal, a direction that the rest of your goals point toward? I think if you go throughout life without goals, you just kind of wander around aimlessly. Even if you don't make a formal goal, we all have goals, right? If you don't, you just kind of wander through life aimlessly. And if you don't have a meta goal that you're shooting towards with your whole life, then you may not be wandering around aimlessly, but you may be darting in one direction for one year and then make a different set of resolutions and dart in the next direction the next year or however often you're making goals and resolutions. So it's important to have an idea where we're going with our life. I'm going to read from Philippians chapter 3, 12 through 14. Paul's writing, speaking. Philippians chapter 3, verses 12 through 14. Not that I have already obtained it, or have already become perfect, but I press on so that I may lay hold of that which, was already, which also I was laid hold of by Christ Jesus. 
Brethren, I do not regard myself as having laid hold of it yet, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind, reaching forward to what lies ahead, I press on towards the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. So Paul has a goal he's pressing towards, that upward call of Christ Jesus. His whole life is centered around that direction, going in that way. We as Christians have a direction or a target for our lives as well. We might call this target our calling, the call of God on our lives. So usually when we speak about calling, sometimes, especially like in youth group, this is a very popular theme in youth group, right? It can seem like this big mysterious thing. What is the call of God? The call of God and what's God's will for my life? So I just want to, just a definition for the call of God. I think it's very simple. It kind of takes the mystery out of it. Work assigned to you by God. That's the call of God. Feel free to negate anything I say you don't agree with. I, don't, <laughs> I see you agree, so that's a good one. But <laughs> y'all watch him. If he starts going, <laughs> that's okay. <laughs> work assigned to you by God. So what is the work that God has called you to? I want to look at a few ways to think about calling that might be a little different for you. They're a little, they were a little different for me. This is all just kind of things that God has shown me, some in the past, and some, one thing very recently that I'm going to start with. But I just want to look at calling, a couple of angles of calling. I'm going to start with, yeah, like I said, the one that's most recently been revealed to me by, I think, you know, what God has taught me during my time in language school. I'm going to start with a little bit of audience participation though we already had a Q&A time so you're warmed up for that so think for just a moment about your calling what's your calling and then I'm gonna ask for volunteers to tell me what your calling is do I have any volunteers to tell me what your what's your calling what's God's call on your life now I'm gonna start like pointing I can't name names necessarily but <laughs> Anybody got a call for your life? Okay. Wife, mom, teacher, pastor, slash crafter. Okay. Wife, mom, teacher, crafter. So there's a hand over here. There it is. Uh, serve others. Serve others. Okay. Very good. Thank you. Now, what is the call for your family? What is the call for your church? As Americans, North Americans, we tend to think very individualistically. And when we talk about God's calling, we tend to, oh, I'm always like, well, this is my calling. That's your calling. What is my calling? What is your calling? Well, we ask, what is our calling? That's a foreign concept to many of us, I think. At least it was to me. So the first way I want to look at, the first angle, the first light I want to sh shed on calling is individual calling versus calling in a corporate sense. Have you ever thought about a corporate calling? We, we don't as, a, as United States Americans. I don't, I don't think so. I've never really encountered it. Because we in our culture think very individualistically, and so we think of individual callings. But something that was brought out and made obvious again and again in language school is just how indiv well, yeah, it's just how individual. Sorry, I'm all scrambled in my notes. <laughs> just how individualistically we think, as opposed to the majority of the world. The language school we we're a part of if you weren't here for the first hour, was a seminary for Spanish speakers. It's in South Texas, but the students come from all over the world, over 20 different countries. And so we've been immersed in Latino culture for a year. And Latino culture is very different than our culture. And the difference comes out in all kinds of ways. It changes just about everything in day-to-day -day life. 
The big thing for them is they're a group culture. They're a communal culture. And before I got to language school, you know, I tell them, okay, us United States Americans, we're a cold culture. Other cult they're a warm culture. We're an individual culture. They're a communal culture. And that's something like, oh yeah, I understand that. But I didn't understand that. Till so you start butting heads every day, rubbing against that culture and realizing just how different and upside down it can feel. For an example, one day at language school, we got a, a message sent to us from our director. He needed help moving a desk. They were changing offices. They built a new building and they're moving a desk from second story in this building, down the stairs, across the street, up the stairs to the second story in this building. And only two people could show up to help, myself and a guy named Matt. So we show up to move this desk, and it's a big, old, wooden desk, heavy. And it's filled with books and papers and files and stuff. So Ariel's there, our director, and Matt and I. So we just, we take everything out of the drawers, and then we take the drawers out of the desk, right? That's how we do it, make it light. We're going to move this thing. And then we went and got a hand truck. And we put this thing on a hand truck, and we bumped it down the steps and across the street and up. But while we're moving things out of the desk, Ariel says, oh, wow, the American way. We're like, what do you mean the American way? <laughs> he said, I just watched five Latinos spend about an hour doing this same thing, but they didn't empty the desk. So they had five guys up in there, and they're picking up this desk and moving a little bit and setting it down and picking it up and down the stairs, across the street, up the stairs, into the office. And, said, and, they, and we did it in 20 minutes, just the two of us in a hand truck. So that's the difference. And we think, oh, well, now they see how it's done. They'll do it like this next time. No. <laughs> because to them, it's not what you're doing or how you're doing it. It's who you're doing it with. And they, they look at us like, oh, only two people showed up. These poor guys. They have to do it almost alone. <laughs> That's the difference. It's a very different way of thinking, upside down and backwards to us. <laughs> but it's not a right versus wrong. It's just different. And it brings out something very special in the church body that I think we miss they have a sense of community, of belonging, and they have a sense of their goals are communal. Their calling is within community. And if you think about it, the culture in which the Bible was written and the culture that the Bible was written to was that, that same way. We are farther removed from the biblical context than they are because their culture is much more similar to the biblical culture. And so when, when I started to wrap my mind around this community versus individualistic thing day, day in and day out, and it becomes part of my life and not just something I'd heard you know, in intercultural studies textbooks, and then you read the Bible, and some things start popping out quite a lot differently. What's the first word of the Lord's Prayer? Our. Not my Father in heaven, our Father in heaven. I was like, wow. That's strange. I don't know what, what point to, but when I read that, I was like, our Father in heaven. Like, this is a corporate thing. Most of the books in the New Testament are written to groups. You have some letters like Timothy, Titus, Philemon, but the majority of them are written to the church at such and such city, you know, to the Galatians to the Romans, to the Hebrews, they're written to groups. And now when I read those books, I have always tended to apply it like it's written to me. And so when a preacher's preaching out of Ephesians, this is what I did. I think this is what a lot of American citizens do. Paul says something. The preacher says it to us as a group, but we're thinking this is what it means to me or how I apply it to me. But it's to a group. Let me read a few scriptures here. Ephesians chapter 4, verses 1 through 6. As a prisoner of the Lord, then, I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. What's that? Who's that sound like it's addressed to? Or how many people does that sound like it's addressed to? I've always looked at that as like, 
as a prisoner of the Lord, then I urge you, one person, to live one life worthy of the calling you have received. But what comes next? Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Paul's addressing a group. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. Paul's making a case for unity within a group of people. The words, I urge you to live a life worthy of calling. In English, we only have one word for you, whether it's singular or plural. I can talk to you, or I can talk to you. And that creates a problem here in this text. In Texas, we have solved this problem, and we have y'all. You are y'all. <laughs> but you're not going to read that in the Bible. It becomes a little bit more clear in Spanish. And I, if you could take it back to the Greek, it would be the same way. But in Spanish, they have a singular you or a plural you. And then they break it down and you can have an informal or a formal. I'm teaching you what I've just learned. <laughs> so, so in the Bible, you would read, I'm talking to tu or vosotros. Singular or plural. And when you read Ephesians chapter 4, verses 1 through 6 in Spanish... He uses vosotros. It's plural. Philippians chapter 2, verses 1 through 4. Therefore, if you, and when I'm reading this, I'm always thinking, okay, if I have any encouragement from being united with Christ, any comfort from his love, if any common sharing in the spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded having the same love, being in one spirit and one mind. So now he's, he's not talking to me, he's talking to a group. Do nothing out of selfish, selfish ambition or vain conceit, rather in humility value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of others. So these scriptures, they hit differently when I read these texts as being addressed to a group. And I know, like, you know, oh, it's Ephesians. Obviously, it's written to a group. I would have, you know, thought. I would say, yeah, he's writing to a group. But when I'm really deep down thinking about it here in a sermon, I'm always thinking about just me as an individual. And studying Latino culture, being immersed in Latino culture this past year, has really opened my eyes to how differently community-oriented cultures think and live. Sometimes, like I said, it feels crazy and backwards. But that is, there's a calling. These two scriptures I read are a calling to churches. And we can apply this to any church. This is our calling as a church, to be like-minded, to consider one another above ourselves. These are callings for the church. In America, when we consider calling, we tend to think from a, we start in and we work our way out. What is God calling me to? How can I put that calling into action in my church? And then how can I put that into action in the community? And then into the world? Always starting with me, working outward. And usually just dragging my family along without a whole lot of forethought. This is what God's called me to. This is where we're going. Come on, family. Right? But what if... For the sake of an exercise, we started outward and worked our way in. What if we ask, we started asking the question by, what is God doing in our community? How is God calling our church to accomplish his work in this community? How may God be calling my family to serve? How may God be calling me to lead my family to assist my church? in fulfilling God's work in our community and around the world for his glory. Start out, work your way in, and then work your way back out. Again, it's not like a right versus wrong. It's just a different way of looking at calling. 
and one that personally gives me a framework to work within when contemplating my calling or my goals, setting my resolutions. The, it gives me the meta goal to aim for. Our callings are meant, I believe this is true, our callings are meant to be used in community in conjunction with the calling of others. So we have to get a little bit beyond just our individualistic calling and realize how our calling interconnects and works along with the calling of others. 1 Peter chapter 4, 10 through 11. Each of you should use whatever gift you have received to serve others as faithful stewards of God's grace in its various forms. If anyone speaks, they should do as one who speaks the very words of God. If anyone serves, they should do it with the strength God provides, so that in all things God may be praised through Jesus Christ. To him be the glory and the power forever and ever. Amen. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 13. The body is a unit, though it is made up of many parts, and though all its parts are many, they form one body, so it is with Christ. For we are all baptized by one spirit into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, slave or free, and we are all given the one spirit to drink. Not, not strange scriptures, scriptures we've heard all our lives, but scriptures that have taken on kind of a new meaning as I've become more aware of what it means to live community focused and not just individually focused. The body is a unit. You know, the callings we receive from God are fulfilled in community. So that's what, that's what I've been learning and wrestling with this past few months. Just, just understanding or learning how to get beyond just myself and my calling and realizing how it connects and works along with those around me and how we can think as a church more community, more one body like instead of just individual members working our individual ministries we can realize that we can have a goal, a calling as a church as a whole. We do have a calling as a church as a whole. And we need to figure out how our callings further that calling. Observation number two about callings is uh, mysterious versus obvious. Sometimes we act like God's call is some mysterious thing that requires meditation and a pilgrimage and you know mysticism type stuff uh, but I was a youth minister for a couple of years and I always told the youth group 99% of God's will for you 99% of God's call for you is written down it's in the Bible 98% of it can be summed up in one verse when Jesus said the greatest commandment is love the Lord your God with all your heart soul mind and strength and the second is like it love your neighbor as yourself that only leaves you with one, one and a half percent to work with. And then when I was trying to organize this, I kept writing like sentence after sentence and not really getting anywhere. So I fell back on a resource that I like. It is a Table Talk. I don't know if you've ever heard of Table Talk. It's a magazine put out by Ligonier Ministries, Oz, no, yes, R.C. Sproul's ministry. So here's a couple of uh, categories that Table Talk organized our, our one, our, the, the written down part, the 99% part. Two categories of callings. They fall within the story of creation and the story of redemption. Within the story of creation, we are all called to exercise dominion over the earth. We are called, for the most part, to marriage and procreation. We are called to holiness. And we are called to organize society and obey authority. And all of those callings are found within the first few chapters of Genesis. And then in the story of redemption, we are all called to repent and believe. We are called to sanctification. And then we are called to work out our vocation in light of our redemption. So the call of God, most of it is written down. It's not a big mysterious thing that requires a pilgrimage. Observation number three is deal with vocation. Usually when we talk about the call of God, we kind of set up a false secular versus sacred juxtaposition. 
right? Talk about calling. There is no secular and sacred distinction. It's a mistake the reformers tried to rescue us from in the 1500s, but still lingers around. I'm going to talk about God calling me to missions. You may not talk about God calling you to be a CPA. That's not how we usually frame that conversation. But it's how we can frame it. There was a stockbroker who was very good at what he did, made a lot of money, and then he became a Christian, and he wanted to serve God. So he became a missionary and went to South America and was down there for a couple of years and was looking around and thinking, I'm a really poor missionary. Like, I'm not very good at this. There are other missionaries around who are really good at it, but they don't have any money. So fortunately, he freed himself from this sacred secular dichotomy, and he went back to stockbroking, made a lot of money, started funding the missionaries. That was God's call on his life. But the way we tend to talk about it, God's calling in church, it puts a lot of young Christians in that same place where they become Christians and they want to serve God. So they think, okay, I need to be a missionary or a pastor or something along those lines. But that's not necessarily what they're called to. And it's not any more or less holy to be called to one or the other. All callings have transcendent meaning because human callings spring from our status as God's image bearers. This includes teachers forming the thought patterns of their students in the areas of their expertise, police officers bringing civil order to their jurisdiction, and plumbers bringing order to the flow and use of water in society. That's the most distinguished description of a plumber I've ever read. <laughs> like, plumbers are the butts of a lot of jokes sometimes, but... <laughs> but yeah, <laughs> plumbers bringing order and flow to the use of water. That sounds like a high calling. Order to the flow and use of water in society. This means that Christians, for Christians, calling is not to be understood in hierarchical terms in which church ministry is considered sacred over against the common callings of other work. Rather, all vocations are equal in value in the kingdom of God. This broader understanding of a calling corrobor corroborates the, with the biblical notion that every aspect of human life, whether one is a rector or a riveter, provides opportunity for worshiping God. After all, we are all called to love God with our whole person, whole heart, self, and personal effort in the world. Deuteronomy 6 through 5 is the greatest commandment that that comes from. And by vocation, we do not necessarily mean a wage-earning profession. The CPA, ditch digger, soldier, homemaker, retiree, or elementary school student are all pursuing God's call in their lives through God-honoring work. That last one it sticks out to me, elementary school student. In the past in my life, it's kind of like in high school, you start wondering about God's call in your life. You know, am I going to go to college? What am I going to pursue as a degree? What am I going to do with my life as a career? But God has a purpose and a calling for us way, beyond, way before high school. Elementary school students have a calling. So there's not a secret, sacred or secular divide in our thinking of callings. 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 17. Nevertheless, each person should live as a believer in whatever situation the Lord has assigned to them, just as God has called them. And observation number four is the second most recent thing that God has shown me about callings. And it's permanent versus progressive. We should also recognize that our callings can change. The prophets Isaiah and Ezekiel and others receive different calls at different stages of their lives. And we also ought to expect that our calling might change over the course of our lives as new opportunities become available to us, and as the times and needs of others around us change. If you were here for the for a Sunday school hour, and I shared how I felt God calling me to music ministry, and then I felt like maybe he wasn't calling me to full-time ministry, but was calling me to something else, and it turns out he's calling me to mission aviation. I don't think that in the previous years that I misunderstood God's calling that I was pursuing a call into music ministry when he hadn't called me. He, I believe he had called me to music ministry. 
And if it hadn't been for my pursuing of music ministry, I would not have bumped into Jeff Combs at church and been here in Bolivar when SOAR opened up. Our callings can be progressive and change. We often, I think, box ourselves in when we figure out what God has called us to in this moment, and that's all we ever are open to. We need to always be listening to God's call. It can change. And as we mature, I think God often uses a call to prepare us for a future call or to position us for the next call, as is in my life. And we need to be open and to hearing and willing to receive a new assignment. I think in church, like I said, we, we box ourselves in. I think about like when we do our spiritual gifts. Usually there's a sermon series on spiritual gifts. Sometimes we take that little quiz, what's my spiritual gift? And I think, okay, my spiritual gift is leadership. And the one I am least likely to be involved in is mercy. So now I'm a strong leader. You need help? I'm sorry. Mercy is not my spiritual gift. <laughs> and we've boxed ourselves in. That's not how it, how it works, you know? And the same with our calling. God's called me to teach Sunday school. And there's an opening on the praise team or an opportunity in the community. Sorry, that's not my calling. I'm a Sunday school teacher. Callings can change. <laughs> Maybe you're not supposed to be a Sunday school teacher anymore if you're not open to doing some other things outside of Sunday school. But So those are just four things surrounding the idea of God's calling. Individual versus community. The obvious versus mysterious. And what was the second one? I'm missing the second one. Thank you. Thank you. Sacred versus secular. And then permanent versus progressive. Progressive is kind of a bad word, politically speaking, but all that means <laughs> is it's unfolding. <laughs> Can be updated. So I close with these questions. As a church, as a community of Christ followers, what is your calling? How are you as family units and individuals helping your church fulfill that calling? And when was the last time you prayed over your calling as a church or individual? And have you considered that it might have changed or be changing? I'll close us in prayer and wrap up here. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day and we thank you for the blessing of community, the opportunity to be here, to sharpen one another, to encourage one another. And we also thank you that you have placed a call on each of our lives and you have placed a call on us as a body of believers. And you have a call for your church globally. We ask that you will help us to pursue that, give us the strength to fulfill it, and guide us as we seek your will for our lives and our family and our church to impact our community and the world around us for your glory. We ask that you go through with us throughout the rest of this week and we bring glory to you in all that we do. And in Jesus' name, amen. All right, as Nathan started getting into our, our message this morning, I'm like, wow, the things that he was saying and the things that he was um, dealing with here are the same things that God had laid on my heart. If you picked up a bulletin, Braden already tried to promote the bulletin, remember that. And so if you picked up the bulletin, though, in the pastor's corner, that was the exact topic yeah. that I'm writing about. I started writing about the will of God and how that this is the most common question or common topic that people ask me about. How do I know the will of God? How do I discern what God's doing in my life? What direction should I go? And so I started, I wrote that in the pastor's corner and said, hey, over the next three weeks, we're going to break this down into different parts. And when Nathan is preaching through that, I'm going, wow. I mean, God is just like dovetailing some stuff. So I don't know who needs to hear what Nathan just said. I know I did. 
okay? Some of the parts of the communal versus the individual, some of the parts of the progressive versus permanent, is the understanding that God is working, but we have to get on board with what he is doing and not say, God, I am steadfast, I am doing what I want to do, now you come and bless me, you join me in what I'm doing. No, we join God in what he is doing and partner with him in whatever that looks like, and that can be individually, but individually, we are working together with our family, with our church, okay, with others that are around us within this body of faith to accomplish ultimately the glory of God. And so, man, such great, great things to ponder over. I hope that you wrote down uh, each of these ideas. Let me go through them one more time. And if you didn't write them down, go ahead and, and write them down. <laughs> the call of God, communal versus individual. Okay? Is God just calling me to be a lone ranger? Or is he calling me to work together with other believers to be able to accomplish a greater cause and a greater purpose? And ultimately, that's really what this is all about. Us as a church partnering with a brand new missionary, going to the field, them partnering with us to encourage us and say, hey, there's a whole new sphere of ministry. There is something that God might be calling you to do vocationally, something that is outside of, well, I'm just, I'm a church planner, I'm starting a church. What they're doing is an amazing work and so necessary. Okay, maybe God is speaking to somebody here in this room even this morning about that type of ministry or another support ministry that is going to enable, um, I mean, so many other things to take place. But if they're not there, those other things don't place, take place either. They are such a critical part. So communal versus individual, mysterious versus obvious. And he used the same analogy that, that, that we often use here as far as you open up the Bible, that's God's will. Okay. It's usually not the mysterious thing. Most of it is revealed. God says, do this, don't do that, follow this, trust me. Okay, there are some aspects of prayer. There are some aspects of discernment and wisdom. Okay, but most of it's already revealed. It's obvious to us. The sacred versus the secular. Okay, everything that we do is to glorify God. Okay, in, in the workplace, whatever it is that we're doing, wherever it is that we find ourselves in life, that is to honor and glorify the Lord Jesus Christ. Whether we would consider that a secular vocation or whether we would consider it, quote unquote, sacred as a, as a pastor, as a music leader, as a, as a teacher, whatever, um, in that kind of sense. Or ver and then the permanent versus progressive. Am I set that this is the only thing that God could ever do okay, in my life? I hope that we don't get there. I know that I have, have that kind of mentality at times, that I get kind of grounded, that this is, this is what God's going to have me to do, and, and I'm just going to plow forward even when I feel God saying, hey, go this way or go that way, because I'm a, I'm a determined person in that sense. I'm, I'm goal-oriented, and if it deviates from that goal, I'm suspicious. God, what are you doing? I don't understand, and so I, I'm, I'm afraid of that at times, but we have to follow what God's doing. Okay, as a church, as individuals, as family, as we work together. And through this, as we wrestle with the call of God, guys, I hope that you're encouraging one another. I hope that you are, that you are investing in community okay, as a church and that we are following what God is doing um, as a whole, as a body going forward. And as we start 2022, I can't think of a better way to really get our minds thinking about what is the communal call of God in our church. How can we best honor, glorify the Lord Jesus Christ? How can we serve him to, to a better extent in, in right here in Bolivar and then around the world? So, man, what a great, great challenge. Let me encourage you guys again uh, to get around, talk to Nathan after the services. He'll be back uh, either in the back there or there in the foyer. So get around, grab one of those prayer cards, uh, and actually pray for him, all right? Do you have an email address or anything on there? Okay, so he's got an email address. Drop him an email. Let him know from time to time that you're thinking about them uh, as they're flying in and out uh, of all sorts of different places. Those runways, how long are the runways in the mountains? Okay, they seem really short. Okay, if you didn't see this video, we'll try and put that video on our uh, YouTube page for the church. I mean, you, you, you see these airplanes taking off, and the next thing you see is just rocks and mountains all around them. It's like, that's amazing. So be praying for them as they're doing uh, this type of, of work and ministry. Uh, and I'm just excited to see what the Lord's going to do, to be able to get their prayer letters and to see people that are coming to Christ, to see tribal people that are uh, reaching their own people and ministering and how they're able to, to come alongside and just uh, fulfill their calling so that ultimately we all can fill our, fulfill our callings to glorify the Lord.
Guys, thank you so much for being here with us today. we got information on the back tables, some things for you to take uh, with you. If you're not involved in a life group, uh, we were wanting to try and promote those and continue to grow those this year. And so talk to me, talk to Braden if you would be interested in joining a life group and are not yet part of one. Uh, we just That's another part of the communal aspect. And so a lot of different things uh, that, that um, we encourage you uh, to look into. And uh, we'll go ahead and dismiss this morning. Let me go ahead and close this in prayer, and then uh, we will see you all next Sunday morning. Our Heavenly Father, we are thankful uh, to be able to gather and to worship here in this place. Uh, We're thankful, God, that you have called us together uh, to bring honor and glory to the name of your son, Jesus. And Lord, we are thankful, God, that we can be a part of what's happening uh, both locally as well as around the world. Lord, I'm thankful for Nathan and for Kayla, for their family. Uh, God, I am thankful for the calling that you have placed upon their lives. Um, and Lord, just thankful, Lord, that we uh, can, can be privileged to be able to partner with them and excited to see, Lord, what you're going to do uh, through them. God, we thank you for your church. Lord, we thank you for this body of believers and, Lord, their passion, their desire uh, to do more for missions, to do more to reach people uh, here and around the world. And, Lord, I just pray that you would fan that flame, fan that passion to be able to um, help us to see, God, even more clearly uh, the next step that you would have us to do together. Lord, we pray these things in Jesus Christ's name. Amen.